A colleague gave me this story to share with you. It's a true story. It's about a young adult named Davy Kim. Davy Kim is a producer and a sound designer for radio shows and podcasts. I heard this first person story on the podcast series called Snap Judgment. It's a true story. The title of Davy's story is The Spelling Bee. It's eighth grade and I arrive at school. I've been dreading this day all year long because today is the day that each class has its spelling bee. My friend, my best friend John, shares my pain because, well, we're really good spellers. And it's not good to be a good speller, but you know what? We can't resist a good competition, so we're going to do this. John heads to his class and I go to mine. We have our spelling bee and guess what? We both come out on top and we're going to regionals. After school, we are high-fiving each other and it just so happens that we are the only Asian kids in our grade. So we joked between ourselves that our Asian power helped us win. A few weeks later, John and I carpooled to the regional level spelling bee and we're pretty confident about it this year. One of us is going to take home the first place trophy. We scope out the competition. In front of us, there are four older judges. They look grave and serious. I notice that John and I are the only Asian kids here, again, which, you know, doesn't really matter, whatever. The spelling bee begins, and students are getting eliminated left and right until there's only a handful of us left. Some of the kids who got cut were waiting in the back with their parents, crying. The judges look at the word sheet, and then they look at each other. And then they take a look at John, and they start chuckling to themselves. And one of the judges then says, don't worry, son, you'll get this word. The entire room was confused, especially John. Oriental. Your word is oriental. The judges start laughing to themselves some more, and, and soon the rest of the room starts snickering. But I'm not. I get it. How can this Asian kid mess up the word oriental? But still, this is embarrassing for John. John's about to start spelling. He's nervous from all the attention. His knees are shaking, his hands are fidgeting, and he begins oriental. O, R, E, and then he stops. He messed up and he knows it. He just turns around and he heads over back to the back of the room. And man, I am furious now, but the only way to get back at everyone is to win this thing. And soon it's my turn again. And I wonder what word I'll get. Asiatic, Confucius? I walk up to the front of the room, and I'm a little nervous. Raconteur. Your word is raconteur. Well, I have no clue what this word means, but I've seen it around, so I'm pretty sure I know how to spell it. And I rehearse it in my head. Raconteur. R-A-C-O-N-T. I got it. I ask for the word in a sentence. I ask for a definition just to make sure. I am ready to spell it out, but right before I do, I look back and I see John. And he's not crying like some of the other kids, but you know, he just looks really sad. I look the judges right in the eye and I begin spelling my word. Raconteur. R A C I S, T, raconteur. When I first heard this story, I was so surprised by the twist, I nearly fell off of my chair. I didn't see it coming. Did you see it coming? I'm betting that no one that day saw it coming. So here's how Davy Kim ends his story. This is what happens after he finishes the spelling word his spelling, his word. I don't turn around. The judges and the parents and all the students have their eyes locked on me. I just stand there facing the judges 
for four very uncomfortable seconds, and no one is laughing. I leave the stage. I go over to my best friend, and we walk out of that spelling bee medalless but victorious. I love this story for all sorts of reasons. I love this story. It must have felt good to put those judges in their place, to take a stand against their casual racism as an eighth grader, no less. I am in awe of Davy Kin. So here's my question for today. What would Jesus think of what Davy Kim did? Was that turning the other cheek? Loving your enemy? Let's dig a little deeper into this teaching of Jesus in our text this morning. It's one of the more well-known things that Jesus said, right? It's at the heart of Jesus' message. Jesus begins his teaching reminding people of the Israelite standard for justice. You have heard it said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. Jesus is sharing us, with us the standard of his day. How primitive, right? Leviticus 24, 20 reads, Fracture for fracture, eye for eye, tooth for tooth. The injury inflicted is the injury to be suffered. Well, in the ancient world, this was actually a pretty high standard. It was meant to set strict limitations on the right to revenge, to avoid escalation. Not two eyes for one eye. A proportional response is what we call it these days. And it's still a pretty high standard. Modern governments often struggle to respond proportionally to violence against their citizens. When the United States is threatened, it doesn't matter whether there's a Democrat or a Republican in office, the response is the same. For example, when George W. Bush said his first public address after 9-11, he says, if bin Laden thinks he can hide and run from the United States and our allies, he will be sorely mistaken. Those who make war against the United States have chosen their own destruction. I will not settle for a token act or our response must be sweeping, sustained, and effective, unquote. This is not a proportional response. This is, you hurt us, we hurt you harder. An eye for an eye puts limits on such a response. And Jesus takes it a step further. Do not resist an evildoer, he says. Turn the other cheek. Now we know what this means. Don't respond in kind. Don't meet violence with violence. In other words, be passive, be a doormat. Let people walk all over you. Except that doesn't feel very good, does it? That doesn't sound very appealing. Don't get me wrong, I am for nonviolence, for ending the cycle of retaliation, and I think Jesus asks too much of those on the receiving end of oppression and abuse. Unless that's not what Jesus is asking us. So I want, to list, I want us to listen to this text with fresh ears. And I'm going to uh, use the work of one of the most important social and political theologians in the 20th century. His name is Walter Wink. And he died in 2012. And he was a pretty amazing biblical scholar and teacher and activist, a student of first century culture and language. Do not resist an evildoer is how our text reads this morning. And according to Wink, that's a bad translation. But a much closer version to the Greek, to the original Greek, would be, don't react violently against the one who is evil. This shift in language sets a different tone for what follows. Rather than being told not to resist, the people are told not to resist violently. And then there's the whole thing about turning the other cheek. Jesus is describing something that happened all the time in the ancient world between people of different social status, say a slave owner and a slave. The owner would slap the slave with the back of his hand. The owner didn't need a reason. The slave owner or the slave would cower and submit and slink away. Jesus suggests a different response. 
He suggests that the slave stand tall and look at the slave owner in the eye and offer the other cheek. And in that culture, that move is unexpected and challenging, bordering on defiant. And Jesus is inviting the one being hit to take back a little control, to assert a little dignity. The saying about going the second mile and giving your cloak to the one who sues you for your own cloak makes a similar point. Roman law permitted soldiers to follow civilians to carry their gear for one mile, but because of abuses, stringently prohibited more than one mile. If, we, if they ask you to do that, Jesus says, go ahead, but then carry their gear a second mile. Put them in an uncomfortable position. Either they risk getting in trouble, or will they will have to wrestle their gear back from you. And now about the coat and the cloak part of today's passage. Under civil law, the coat would be confiscated for non-payment of debt. For the poor, the coat often served as a blanket at night. And in that world, the only other garment typically worn by a peasant was an inner garment, a cloak. So if they take your coat, Jesus says, give them your cloak as well. In other words, strip naked. Show them that the, what the system is doing to you. Surprise them. Disrupt them. Make them uncomfortable. So when Jesus tells those gathered to turn the other cheek, he isn't giving some very, he's giving us some very interesting advice. Don't respond violently. Don't respond in kind. Neither be passive, but be creative and be challenging. Assert your humanity. Jesus is proposing a third way that is neither violent nor passive. He asks us to give up revenge and give up complacency. The third way is narrow and challenging, and we need it now more than ever. We need it now more than ever because after a year or two years of isolation and quarantine and in separation and fear and definite certainty, uncertainty, people are acting out of their most extreme selves right now. Let me say that again. People are acting out of their most extreme selves. Has anyone driven on 270 recently? <laughs> Jesus calls us to embrace this third way in our families, in our communities, in our churches, and in our nation. There is nothing easy or straightforward about this path. Jesus insists that it is a better way a way that leads to life and to hope for all of God's children. This third way is disruptive and creative. Kind of like spelling raconteur, R-A-C-I-S-T. And I want to end by going back to David Kim's story. His first instinct was to win the contest to get back at those who had humiliated his friend, an eye for an eye. Davy realized that the contest was stacked against him and John. He chose to respond in a way that was disruptive and creative. He intentionally failed and joined his best friend in defeat. A defeat that from where I'm standing looks a lot like victory. What does Jesus say about his response? I think Jesus would be proud. Amen.